your Bibles tonight, Revelation chapter number 11, Revelation chapter number 11, and I'm thankful we think about that song, that we live in the day of God's grace, and it's exciting that his grace is extended to us, and we have this opportunity to turn to him in faith and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have his grace and mercy, uh, but I want you to understand something in God's word uh, that doesn't last forever. There's coming a day when the Lord's going to rapture his church. And when he raptures the church, the opportunity for folks who've heard the gospel message to be saved will come to an end. And there'll be a great delusion. And you'll, want, you'll reject Christ. And, and uh, the penalty of sin will be death and hell forever. And uh, I'm thankful right now we are still living in the day that God's mercy and grace is extended to mankind. And if you're here today and you've rejected Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you've decided to, uh, that your way is better than God's way, I want to remind you that you have an opportunity now that you may not have after a while. Uh, if we were to look at the, prof, the prophetic calendar of, in God's Word and the prophetic calendar, the next page we turn in the calendar of God's uh, plan for the world is Jesus is coming back and uh, the opportunity to be saved is, is soon passing and I think that's one of the reasons why the Bible says today this is the day of salvation and uh, the time to be saved the time to return to the Lord is now today we're, and tonight we're looking at Revelation chapter number 11 verses 1 through 14 and I'm going to preach tonight and talk to you about the two witnesses of the great tribulation the two witnesses of the Great Tribulation. I'm confident that these are two men and they're two witnesses in sackcloth. They're in Jerusalem, the city of God, and the, most likely the second half of the Great Tribulation. And they are going to be witnessing, preaching of Jesus, the coming of Christ, the message of the gospel to the folks that are in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem at this moment is going to be in a horrible, horrible, sinful, wicked condition and the people of Jerusalem the people of the world are going to hate the two witnesses they're going to hate their message because they hate Jesus they've been led astray by the Antichrist they're going to hate uh, the the message of repent because Jesus is coming again and uh, the witnesses we're going to see what happens to them we start in the temple then we see the witnesses and we see uh, some of the power that they have then we watch the witnesses as they die they're killed by the great beast from the bottomless pit. But three and a half days later, they rise from the dead. And uh, God gives victory to his witnesses, raptures them into glory. The two witnesses of the great tribulation. We follow along with me. Remember, as we read chapter number 11, we're looking at an event that has not yet occurred. And uh, we're getting insight into the prophecy, what's going to happen after the rapture, after the first three and a half years of the tribulation. In the middle of the tribulation, we're going to see and we're going to meet up with these two witnesses. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 11, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. And devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony... The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. 
and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven. The remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And this is a fascinating story. We're, we're in the temple. We're in Jerusalem. And we have these two witnesses. And they're going to witness for 1,260 days. Or they're going to witness for 42 months. Or they're going to witness for three and a half years. All are the same. And they're going to witness. And they're going to give witness in sackcloth. They're going to tell us about, uh, about Jesus. They're going to mourn over the sinful condition and the blinded eyes of the people of Jerusalem and the wickedness of God's city and God's temple. And uh, there's going to be brokenheartedness. And uh, they're going to witness. And we're going to see the witnesses slain. Their bodies laid in the street. Three and a half days later, they're going to rise again. An earthquake's going to happen. And uh, a fascinating story and some details I hope to share with you that I hope will be a help to you. The two witnesses of the Great Tribulation. Let's just start here in the very beginning. The first part of this passage of Scripture is the temple. We see the temple in the first two verses. The Bible says in verse 1, There was given me, John, a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. So we get this commission, and John is told to take the rod and measure now, there's a couple ideas about the rod. Uh, sometimes the rod is simply used as a measuring tool. And uh, sometimes when you take and you begin to measure something, you claim it as your own. And it's an interesting thought here when we come to this temple because uh, I don't know about you, but when I study my Bible, sometimes the, the, the temples and the tabernacle and the synagogues, they kind of begin to make my eyes cross. What are we talking about? Which one are we talking about? And, and I, I'll talk to you about the temple for a minute. Uh, so the tabernacle was, was a mobile uh, temple type place. And the temple was in his heart to build the temple. But God said, not you. You can't build my temple. But I'll let Solomon do it. And Solomon built a temple. The first temple we see in the Bible is Solomon's temple. You remember uh, all the, the rigmarole and the excitement about Solomon's temple and how glorious and beautiful it was? The temple, it was, a, it was a beautiful thing, it was wonderful, it was, it was commissioned of God, Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed and another temple was built. The second temple we find in the Bible is Zerubbabel's temple. Zerubbabel's temple lasted for a time and was destroyed. And we see the third temple, Herod's temple. Herod's temple was the temple that would have been around in Jesus' life that was destroyed in AD 70. You remember that date? It's an important date in the history of Christianity, Herod's temple. And since Herod's temple was destroyed, there's not another temple that's been built back. There's two more temples coming. The next temple that will be built is the Tribulation Temple. That'll happen. That'll, that will be there and available at the return, of, at the, the rapture of the church when the temple will be back in Jerusalem. Now, it's fascinating. Have you ever wondered why there's lots of folks who kind of speculate on whether or not they're beginning to, to excavate the, the ground where the temple will be built in Jerusalem? What's the big deal that folks are buying materials to build a temple in Israel, lots of folks are watching what's going on in the nation of Israel for the temple to be built because uh, the temple will be built in order for the return of Christ and for the, this tribulation. This tribulation temple is the one we meet up with in chapter number 11. In chapter number 11, the tribulation temple is there and the temple is, uh, is spoken of. And here's what uh, the Lord does. Now, this temple was built, and the Antichrist is going to, have, is going to be, uh, be seated on the throne in the temple, which is 
anti-Christ and against God. But God says to John, John, get a reed like unto a rod. And he says, rise and measure. Measure the temple of God. Now, I don't doubt at all that there's coming a rod of correction. But also, I can see as to how the Lord is claiming stake on the temple. The devil, the world, the flesh may erect a temple. But I'm going to know something. When God claims it, it's his. And the Lord is not going to allow Satan to rule and reign forever. Be encouraged, folks, because the sin and the trouble and the groaning is temporary. It's temporary. And the temple is God's. And so there's this emphasis here in the first verse. Take the rod and measure the temple. Uh, Measure the temple. Measure the temple of God and the altar. And them that worship therein. I really think my favorite phrase in verse number one is them that worship therein. I really believe that God claims his own. Folks who turn to the Lord and worship God. During the tribulation, I think they'll, they'll, they'll be saved. I think there'll be a mass of people saved. I don't think that if you're here and you're rejecting Jesus and the gospel has been clearly presented to you time and time again, that you are going to have the opportunity to be saved. But I do believe that folks are going to be saved. In the great tribulation, and Jesus claims stake on the temple. Verse number 2, but... You have those that are them that are worshiping therein. In verse number 2, but... The court, which is without the temple, leave it out, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Those that are without, the Gentiles. What are the Gentiles doing? What are, what are, what are the lost doing? What is the world doing? They are treading on God, God's plan, God's way. They're rebelling and rejecting God. In the temple, the temple, verse uh, point number one, the temple. Look at verse number three. We'll look at this. The second point here is the two witnesses witness. The two witnesses witness. The next thing we see is that the two witnesses are witnesses. So when we come to Jerusalem this moment, there's great sin. It's a, it's a wicked place. It's interesting to see and think and make some comparison. Have you ever noticed, have you noticed that there are lots of places that once were beautiful and glorious and awesome that... The world, the flesh, and the devil have turned into just awful things. I think about some of the things that Satan and sinful people have taken over that uh, once were glorious and good. And I think about even cities in our country. Cities in our country who at one time was a beautiful place, an awesome spot, a place you could take your friend, your family, take your friends, a place where, where there were churches and and and. God's people uh, leading the way and being blessed. But now you just say the name of certain cities and immediately the connotation is awful. I'll just go ahead and say it. I spent a lot of time in Buncombe County, North Carolina. I pastored outside of Asheville, North Carolina, in Fletcher, North Carolina. And I'll just tell you, Asheville, North Carolina has developed a reputation as a Sodom and Gomorrah in so many ways. And I love the place. I love the people. I have a burden for the folks. But it's sad to see that the devil and the world and the flesh and literally, literally Antichrist, not the Antichrist of the Great Tribulation, but Antichrist groups of people have claimed stake on places that didn't have to be that way. I think about the fact that Sinful folks have stolen the rainbow, God's promise. And I'm for these folks who say we're trying to get the rainbow back. And I'm not picking a fight with folks. I love people who are rank with sin. But I hate sin. And I hate what the devil's doing. And I know that if we excuse sin, if we excuse sinful behavior, that if we, uh, if we just dismiss it I know that we're not helping anybody 
And we see here these two witnesses. What did the two witnesses do? The two witnesses witness. And I want you to know, when you stand up in a city that is uh, that has turned its back on God and you witness for the glory of God and you witness about the righteousness of God and the coming of Jesus, I want you to know something. You become unpopular very quickly. And these two witnesses in the tribulation, they will they have are dealing with some things that you'll deal with as you stand up for the cause of Christ and the person of Jesus. We see these two witnesses. The two witnesses witness. The Bible says in the third verse here of chapter number 11, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. Something I'm encouraged by this. These two witnesses are taxed with doing a very tough job. But God says, as you do this tough job of witnessing for me, I'm going to give you power. Can I remind you of something? If you'll strike out to serve the Lord, if you'll strike out to be a faithful witness, if you'll strike out to tell others about Jesus in the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, let me tell you something else you'll have. You'll have God's power. I'm thankful for that. These two witnesses, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, I think it's kind of interesting. In verse number two, uh, we talk about uh, this uh, period of time as 40 and two months. You see that at the end of verse number two? 40 and two months. If you take 42 and multiply that by 30, the average numbers of days in a month, well, what's the sum of the, to- or the total of, of that equation? The sum of that equation is 1,260. Now, some folks want to take uh, Revelation chapter number 11, and they want to say these are figurative times. They want to say these two witnesses are two great groups of people. Now, that's not true. They want to say that the, the 42 months are years or something else. Now, look, the Bible says, I'm going to tell you, I think God says, I'm going to tell you four or five different ways so you don't mess this up. He says it's 42 months. You understand me? 42 months. And if in case you didn't understand what 42 actual months are, it's 100, I mean, it's 1,260 days. And here in just a minute, he says, just to give you some clarity, 1,260 days and 42 months is actually three and a half years. Do you understand? He says, this is literal. 1,260 days. He says, the two witnesses, they prophesy for three and a half years, verse 4. These are, the, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. What in the world does chapter, verse 4 have to do with anything? It's kind of fascinating. The book of Revelation is a constant commentary. And so if you want to know who the two witnesses are or you want to know who the two olive trees and the two candlesticks in Zechariah chapter number 4, Zechariah's prophecy... The book of Revelation says, just so you know, so there's no confusion, the two olive trees and the two candlesticks from Zechariah chapter number 4 are the two witnesses I'm telling you about in Revelation chapter number 11. It's a commentary, verse number 4. In my notes, as I was writing all this out, in my notes I said, I just said, it's a commentary. It just tells us what the Zechariah prophecy is about. Verse number 5. If any man will hurt them, if any man will hurt or attempt to hurt the two witnesses, the Bible says, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. I'd like to see that. Can you imagine that type of preacher? Uh, I mean, you, you try to hurt him, and uh, literally fire proceeds out of his mouth. And the Bible says, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. I mean, it's a, it's a, gruesome, it's a gruesome time. It's a gruesome thing. But the Bible says that out of the mouth of, of these two witnesses, fire will fall. It makes us begin to think about who in the world are the two witnesses. Now, I want you to know, I'm just going to tell you, I have no clue who the two witnesses actually are. I know they're two witnesses, and I know there's lots of speculation. And it's fun to think about. One of the two witnesses is uh, is most likely Elijah. It's most likely Elijah. Does it matter? Ultimately, to me, and then for my understanding, that if it was important that I knew exactly who these two witnesses are, God would have said, like a commentary, these two witnesses are Elijah and Moses. Now, I really think that some people fight over things they shouldn't fight over. But it is fun to think about because God gives these two witnesses some qualities that, and gives them some opportunities like he gave to Moses and Elijah. And some of the folks actually think that one of the, uh, the second witnesses is Enoch which I'm kind of compelled to think that's a pretty interesting thought. 
thought. I'll talk to you about it in just a second. But you think about Elijah for a minute. God sent fire from heaven. And then these two witnesses, fire proceeds out of their mouths. In verse number 6, the Bible says, These two witnesses have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. What do they say? They have the power to stop the rain. And the Bible says they have power to stop the rain in the days of their prophecy. I thought it was kind of interesting uh, connection here that w- when Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, it didn't rain for the space of three and a half years, 1,260 days, 42 months, in case you were wondering. It's a fascinating connection. And so we see they have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And so the Bible gives us some insight into these two witnesses. These two witnesses, they witness. They witness in sackcloth and ashes. When you see a witness and a prophet in sackcloth, We see them, it is a picture of mourning. They mourn over the sinful condition. They're pointing people to Jesus. And because they're pointing the people to Jesus, they are hated and despised. But their power is undeniable. I'll give you a little insight, a little thought here. Uh, A lot of people that I respect think it was Elijah and Moses. A lot of people I respect think it was Elijah and Enoch. I don't know. But here's an interesting thought. There's two people in the Bible who did not see death. Elijah didn't see death. Enoch didn't see death. And in this story, in Revelation chapter number 11, we're going to watch two witnesses experience death. Experience death and experience resurrection. And in some ways it makes perfect sense that those two witnesses would be the two men that never experienced death. And they'll be resurrected here in this story. But I'm going to tell you something. That doesn't mean that I'm right. But it does mean that there are two witnesses. And these two witnesses, they witness for three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months. And they witness and they're hated. And God gives them great power. Then the Bible leads us to the next part. We move from two witnesses, witnesses to number two, number three, two witnesses die. The next thing we see is the two witnesses die. Look at the Bible says in verse number 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony. I love that little phrase right there. When they have finished their testimony. Look, the Bible says that no man could hurt them. As long as God had a work for them to do, people tried to hurt them and they were breathing fire and they were dying that death. <laughs> But the Bible says when they, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out the bottom's pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. I think that we can take courage in the fact that as long as God wants us to serve him, we have nothing to fear. And really when God is finished with us, we have nothing to fear. <laughs> you know the day that God finishes with us is a really sweet day. Because the Bible says be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. On the day that the two witnesses, God was finished with their witness. (laughs) They were ushered in the presence of Jesus. Three and a half days later, their body was resurrected with them. As long as God has a work for us to do, we'll live. (laughs) But when he's finished, we'll be glory. (laughs) It'll be glory. He said, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them, and kill them. I'll remind you of something else. Any moment and any time you think that just perhaps the devil has won, he hasn't. Don't be deceived. Don't get so down in the dumps when something doesn't go your way as if the devil has defeated Jesus. He has not. And no doubt there were folks who, part of those folks that were worshiping the one true God, the folks who had had answered and surrendered to Jesus Christ, that they thought, what in the world has happened? Has the devil won? When the two witnesses were killed by the beast out of the bottomless pit, has the devil won? The answer is no, no, no. He hasn't won. He's a defeated foe. Look up, Christian. There's hope. The Bible says in verse 8, their dead bodies 
shall lie in the street of the great city. What's the great city? Jerusalem. The Bible says that their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, there's such an, an important thing to be said here in this passage of Scripture. Their dead bodies are lying in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, you know something. Jerusalem is a holy city. Jerusalem is a holy city of God. It's the city where Jesus was crucified. It's the center of God's plan. It's where the temple will be rebuilt. There's coming a new Jerusalem. Jerusalem's big time. It's important. It's the holy city. But the Bible says of Jerusalem, look what it says. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. What's the Lord telling us here? He's saying, look, the great city of Jerusalem, because of sin, has developed a reputation and is known as Sodom and Egypt. Folks, let me tell you something. Sin will corrupt the holiest of holy. Sin will corrupt you. Sin will destroy you. Sin will cause you to stink. Sin will cause you to do things that are unimaginable. You think about the acts of sodomy. Sodom. Egypt, the world, rejecting God. Sin caused the holy city of God, the place where Jesus was crucified, to be considered as Sodom and Egypt. Let me tell you something else. When Jesus makes spiritual Sodom the center of his empire, he'll rule and reign. And when Jesus comes in a place that once was sin cursed, it's whole, wholesome, holy, right, right again. Hallelujah. When Jesus comes to the city that Jesus was crucified as King of kings and Lord of lords, it'll be holy again. Hallelujah. By the way, until he comes, if you'll let Jesus sit on the throne of your heart, if you let Jesus rule in your life, he'll make you holy and righteous and right. He'll use you and bless you. But if you let sin rule and reign in your mortal body, you'll find out it'll stink like Sodom and Egypt. May God help us. We consider and keep looking at the two witnesses. These two witnesses, they lie. Their dead bodies lie in this great city, which is spiritually called Sodom. In verse 9, the Bible says, And they of the people... And kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in grace. The three witnesses lay out for three and a half days right there in the middle of the street, in the streets of Jerusalem. And all the people let it happen. Look what the Bible says. What else do all the people do? They let their bodies sit out. Don't put them in graves. Verse 10, the Bible says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. What do they do? Man, they're so happy that these witnesses are gone. They rejoice over them. Look what else they do. And make merry. Look what else they do. And shall send gifts one to another. This is kind of maybe silly but fun to think about. But you know, this is something that's happening in the future. And so the Bible says they send gifts one to another. I don't know if a bunch of people get on Amazon and hit ship to my best friend. We're rejoicing because the witnesses are going on. But when you see them talk about sending gifts one to another, uh, I, I wonder what John saw. He may say, I don't know what this is, but they were sending gifts to everybody. The Bible says they're sending gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. These two prophets tormented them. Let me tell you something. When you're running from God, the message of the gospel is torment. Maybe you're here tonight and you feel tormented by the message of the gospel, tormented to attend church, tormented to be anywhere close to the preacher, tormented to read the word. Let me tell you something. That's a great sign that your heart is cold toward the very God who loves you, died on the cross for you and wants to save you, wants to rescue you from the penalty and punishment of sin forever. These people were so thrilled that the witnesses were dead, that they were sending each other gifts. 
all the while living and continuing their rebellion against God. Verse 11. The Bible says, After three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, the witnesses, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. After three and a half days, the Spirit of life from God enters in the bodies of these three dead witnesses, and they're dead no more. And the Bible says, And they heard a great voice from heaven. Who's this? The crowd of people. They heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was a great earthquake. And the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The two witnesses witness, the two witnesses die, and finally the two witnesses are raised. But what happens? The same thing that's always going to happen. God wins. God's people win. Choosing Jesus is always the right choice. We come to this end, these two men, these two witnesses, they raise from the dead. The Lord says, come up hither. A lot of folks have taken those three to words and preached great sermons on heaven, and rightfully so. It's good. Come up hither. I'm thankful that we have the promise of heaven, eternal life, away from this sin-cursed earth in the presence of Jesus. The two witnesses rise from the dead. They come up hither. The Bible says at the same hour there was a great earthquake. What happens? Same thing that always happens when you reject God. There's punishment, penalty, and utter, ultimately, death. The Bible says that the same hour there was, was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. We see 7,000 men slain there in the great tribulation after the earthquake. The next phrase is is uncertain to me. The Bible says the remnant were affrighted. That's not uncertain. They were scared, rightfully so. If you just watch 7,000 people die because of an earthquake, that's scary, right? They were affrighted. that's, That's not confusing. Then the Bible says, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, the big question, and the jury's out, is did the people who gave glory to the God of heaven, did they just act in fear? And have some type of a foxhole faith experience that had nothing to do with putting their trust in Jesus. will know an eternity. But let me tell you something. If you get to the place where you're scared, you allow the fear of God to drive you to repentance. And you repent and you trust in the fact that only Jesus can save you from the penalty of hell. If you begin to be afraid, you turn to the Lord. And you rest in him and his free gift of salvation. And you make sure that you don't just let a fearful moment drive you to some prayer. And then you leave Jesus and forget that he ever did anything to save your soul. I've got a feeling that if somebody got scared and they prayed some type of prayer. And never had a desire ever again to live for Jesus and serve Jesus. I, I've got a feeling that that person probably never repented their sin and believed in Christ Jesus for their soul salvation and was born again. But I'm going to tell you something. Any chance you get, if you're lost, any chance you get that God makes it clear that you're a sinner, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you remember today's the day of salvation. God is faithful. The two witnesses are raised victoriously. God wins. God wins. God wins. Put your trust in Jesus. May the Lord help us to learn a little bit. No more about the two witnesses of the great tribulation.